Hi, this is the overview video for chapter 11, Magnetic Forces and Fields. In this chapter, we go over the background material for magnetism and describe the elementary interaction involving magnetic field. So section 11.1 is the section covering the background on magnetism and giving you a familiar description of magnetism that you might have seen in earlier science classes or maybe even matches with your everyday exposure to magnetism. So if you've seen a refrigerator magnet or you've seen a toy magnet for a child, <laughs> you have seen these magnetic poles, north and south pole, and see how they attract and repel other poles. You might have seen a compass, which is, a, which is an application of this. So that's the familiar description of magnetism in terms of north and south pole and how they attract and repel each other. And what I want you to know is that that is not the elementary fundamental description of magnetic force. So section 11.1 will give you the background material. So read through it and make sure that it all makes sense. It sounds like something you already know <laughs> or maybe something new that you're learning. And in section 11.2, is when we will start to cover the elementary fundamental interaction involving magnetic fields. So your textbook starts out with this uh, uh, description of a magnetic force and definition of magnetic field. You can't really, well, it's a very difficult to define a field without relating it to the force. What I do want to caution you is that this is a mathematically complex uh, expression. I don't think you've had anything like this before. It's an expression that involves three different vectors. One vector as a product of two vectors using this cross product. So if, as you are reading this portion, if this doesn't make too much sense at the moment, persevere and keep pressing on and you will see more detailed description and some examples that will help you get a hold on this mathematical expression. So as you read through it, uh, one thing that I would uh, ask you to slow down and spend enough time on is in the coverage of the right hand rule. This is something that you might have seen in your physics 4a uh, when we discussed rotation and like angular momentum, you might have seen right hand rule there along with cross product. And I have a separate lecture video where um, we'll spend time going over right hand rule and the practice of right hand rule. For now, I would ask you to spend pause a little bit, spend time looking at this diagram and making sure that um, this at least makes some sense to you. So here, what it's describing is if you have your right hand and you orient your right hand so that your um, fingers are in the direction of the first vector, V, and then cross product with B. Um, to do the cross product, you orient your hand so that the fingers can be curled in the direction of the second vector, then the direction your thumb points in that is perpendicular to both uh, of the two uh, vectors in the product. That's the direction of the cross product. So um, there's a separate lecture video for this. Watch out for that and take a look at that if this doesn't make an immediate sense right now. And I just want you to emphasize the importance of understanding this right hand rule because this is going to get used all the time throughout the our coverage of magnetism. Um, and finally, in this section, um, there is a drawing of uh, magnetic field lines that um, hopefully look familiar to you. And the mathematical way we are describing magnetic fields in this section is still consistent with these pictures that you might, th that might be more familiar to you. So in section 11.3, you will see the first example of application of that magnetic force formula. It said that the magnetic force is charge times V cross B. 
And that's uh, what is illustrated here. So imagine this electron, a uh, negative charge, moving to the right with the velocity v. Then when you do v cross b, the, um, so b magnetic field is pointing into the screen. Uh, that's what those x uh, markers mean. Uh, v cross b, point, applying the right hand rule, it points upward on that uh, picture. So V cross B points upward, and the force points downward because you are multiplying that to the negative charge. So the negative sign flips the direction, and the force points inward or downward. Now, when you have this type of force perpendicular to the velocity, this is when you get centripetal acceleration. The velocity tends to change its direction without changing its magnitude. So the particle isn't speeding up or slowing down, it's just a changing direction. Now, as the charge changes direction and it's moving this way, the direction of the force changes too. Because of the property of the cross product, the force will always remain perpendicular to velocity. So that naturally results in a uniform circular motion. So that's the first uh, example of application of magnetic force and how that results in an electric charge that's moving in a circle in a magnetic field. The rest of the section covers more general examples like uh, what if the particle had a velocity that's not entirely perpendicular to the magnetic field but is a little bit parallel to the magnetic field too. In section 11.4 is where you see the second example and actually a second formula for magnetic force. That's the magnetic force on a current carrying wire. And your textbook goes through this uh, derivation here. And this is the formula that we'll be using from time to time. This is the force due to magnetic field on a current carrying wire in terms of the amount of current, which is easier to measure than the drift velocity, times the uh, uh, vector that depends on the geometry of the wire. So um, if you had a straight wire, then this would be magnetic force is equal to I times the length of the wire as a vector, cross product with the magnetic field. And this magnetic force on a current carrying wire can be used for the next example, which is perhaps the most important practical example of magnetic force, uh, because this is the underlying physics of electric motors. If you have a current carrying loop like this between magnets, uh, current going this way, uh, Quick analysis will show that the net force on this loop is zero. This upward force here is cancelled out by this downward force. But these forces result in a torque on, the, on this loop. So the, the loop is made to uh, spin. And as it spins, there are some locations where there is no net torque on the, on the loop, but um, if it's a working motor, by the time it gets to this point, it's already moving, so that momentum or the angular momentum will carry the loop through, and then it'll reach a position where there's torque on it again, so it'll continue to work. So this is the simplified model of an electric motor, and you can explain that using the elementary interaction between electrical current and magnetic field. And while we are on the subject of current loop, this is why we uh, cover the electric dipole and the interactions involving electric dipole. So you can describe a current loop as a magnetic dipole. You define a magnetic dipole moment and you can similarly define electric dipole moment. It's not actually all that similar because electric dipole moment is defined by amount of charge times the separation between the charges. But once you have defined these dipole moments, either magnetic dipole moment or the electric dipole moment, then you have these expressions for the torque and the potential energy 
of the dipole. And these two expressions are the same, or rather they are analogous between the magnetic dipole and the electric dipole. So here you have uh, expressions for the magnetic dipole. The torque on a magnetic dipole is the dipole moment cross product with the magnetic field. And if you go through the analysis, you will find that the torque on electric dipole is equal to electric dipole moment cross product with the electric field. And the same thing with the interaction energy. So for magnetic dipole, the interaction energy is the negative of the magnetic dipole moment, dot product with the magnetic field. If you work out the interaction energy of the electric dipole, you will see it's negative of the electric dipole moment, dot product with electric field. Um, this uh, analogy between magnetic dipole and electric dipole is often useful. So I want you to highlight that now, even though we are not using it quite as much as we might in an upper division electrodynamics class. The next example of magnetic force is the Hall effect. And I have a separate lecture video for that. And your textbook goes into a detailed description of Hall effect. Uh, please read through it. I hope it makes sense. I hope the lecture makes sense. <laughs> Watch out for the separate lecture. And your textbook ends with the section 11.7, additional <laughs> applications of magnetic forces. And you will see some of these in your homework. Um, I think a mass spectrometer is something that you will see in your homework. And uh, some you won't quite see in the homework, but I will find a space where we can talk about these examples. Um, I, mainly because the topics that we'll cover now involving magnetism, they are, they are difficult. They are in many ways not intuitive and they are mathematically more complex. And depending on what your chosen field is, I think one motivation for you to pay attention and work through this difficult material is seeing how useful these are in various applications. That this isn't something esoteric that you learn once and forget, but that this is something that finds use. At least in physics, I think there are other examples of use in biology and medicine, like uh, MRI machine. But even in sticking to physics examples, I hope you see that the, what we are covering now, they are fundamental building blocks of modern technology. So that's all. Um, thank you for watching. Until next time. Bye.